Good morning, class. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you uh, again <laughs> after uh, the weekend. I hope everybody's healthy and happy and uh, feeling good. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off this morning. Well, first of all, I sent you uh, an email a little while ago with your first psychometric uh, homework assignment. Uh, I think it's five or six problems, and I scanned. Uh, realized a lot of you don't have the book. Uh, which is fine. Um, so I scanned the, all of the homework problems out of chapter three and attached it and then told you which ones to work. So they'll be due, uh, I guess, the Tuesday after we get back from spring break. They're not too bad. I don't think they'll take you very long. Uh, these are mostly calculation problems. So I, I don't think there's many of them on the site chart. The second assignment uh, concentrates more on larger problems and we use the psych chart pretty much for it. Um, this is example 3.2, which uh, I struggled to find uh, in my notes the last class. And it is discussing this uh, adiabatic saturator. Uh, we went through, I guess we could go back and look at that. We went through this little derivation up here, uh, the I's in the previous pack of notes. Well, shoot. As things happen, let's see. Should be at the bottom of this. Yeah, here we go. So if you recall, and you can check uh, the previous recording, but we talked through, I think in pretty good detail, the derivation of this. And the, the whole purpose of this device is to generate this adiabatic saturation equation, which we use uh, quite a bit in psychometrics. And that's this uh, equation right here for W1. This gives the, uh, uh, another way to calculate the humidity ratio coming into this device. So all of this would be, if you had just a sample of moist air at some condition one, and you wanted to calculate these properties, if you uh, know the relative humidity or something, then you can determine the dew point and the dew point basically uh, is the adiabatic, I'm sorry, it's not the dew point, it's the wet bulb temperature is uh, essentially the same as the adiabatic saturation temperature, which is T2 in this. So um, it, it is, this is an important equa equation for us and we wanna make sure that uh, you guys are comfortable with using it. So that's why uh, I went back and when I found this, I knew I had it someplace, I just couldn't quite put my hands on it. Uh, so let's just take a look at, at this. So, uh, and the pressure, pressure entering and leaving, there's essentially no pressure drop across this device. So whatever we have over here at one, we have basically the same at two. For a psychometric, I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, atmospheric pressure. It can be any reasonable pressure uh, that the ideal gas laws would apply to. Uh, you know, commonly it's someplace close to atmospheric pressure, but again, it doesn't have to be. Um, so we say the pressure entering and leaving the adiabatic saturator is, you know, basic sea level 14.696, 14.7 rounded. Entering temperature is 80 and leaving temperature is a, uh, 64. And that would be essentially the wet bulb temperature for us or by definition, the adiabatic saturation. So as we uh, as this air flows through this thing and water evaporates into that airflow, it cool, it takes energy. You know, the energy to uh, make that evaporation happen comes from the sensible energy in the air as it flows through this. And so the air cools down, okay? And we're gonna make this thing long enough so this is 100% relative humidity. So we know it's saturated when we come out. And so whatever temperature we get, uh, is the wet bulb temperature. Okay, so here's the equation that we're trying to plug into. And there's a couple of things we have to calculate. This W star S2, <laughs> that's a bunch of 
that's a bunch of subscripts and superscripts, but basically that is the humidity ratio of saturated air at this 64 degrees. So it's saturated, so it's 100% relative humidity. And so if you just go to the tables and look up uh, that temperature table that I gave you and look up 64 degrees uh, and look up the saturation pressure for water, that will be um, this PV. So this is our, you know, this is molecular weights ratio. This is the partial pressure of water vapor. This is the total pressure. And this is again of the water vapor. So we plug this in to get this, uh, the humidity ratio of the saturated air that's leaving the device because <laughs> it's a parameter in the equation, we have to have it, okay? And so that's, in this example, that comes out to be 0 0.0127 uh, pounds of water vapor per pound of moist air. So that's gonna go in here. And then this I star FG2 is the enthalpy of vaporization at 64 degrees. Again, that's just a lookup from the table. So to get these first two terms, um, we pull the saturation pressure at this leaving temperature and plug into this equation, whatever our total pressure is, and we get our humidity ratio at saturation at 64. And then we just, at 64 again, we get the enthalpy of vaporization, which is the enthalpy of saturated vapor minus the enthalpy of saturated water at 64 degrees. So, you know, I guess those are some degree of complication, but once, you know, once you, if you just develop a clear understanding of what the terms are, then it's pretty straightforward. Okay, CPA, so that's the specific heat uh, constant pressure of dry air. And we typically take that for ideal gases at this pressure range about as 0.24. So that's gonna be just 0.24. Uh, in the equation. And then it's the leaving temperature minus the entering temperature. And this is the term that always turns negative. So I've got 64 minus 80, okay? So that defines the entire numerator of this. And then we want the enthalpy of saturated vapor at one, which means the entering temperature, which is the 80 degrees. So you can see there's lots of ways to screw this up. You got to, you just got to keep your head on straight looking at these subscripts and remembering what temperature goes with what subscript. Okay. And then this is the enthalpy of saturated water uh, at 64 at the low temperature. And again, that's, so most of this just look up uh, from the tables, a little bit of calculation, but it's pretty straightforward. So you plug in here. And so that tells you that that humidity ratio coming into the device was 0 0.009. Okay. And so if you're trying to program psychometrics on a computer or something, this is very helpful. You know, you've got to have your steam tables. You got to somewhat know what that saturation pressure is as a function of temperature from the steam tables, but you can do a curve fit on that, or there's lots of packages that you can get that are already out there. So if you do it in MATLAB or if you do it in Excel or something like that. So that's not too hard to come by. So this is uh, an important relation for you. Okay, so that's the calculation of W. Now, the, th the other thing they ask is to calculate the relative humidity, okay? And so this is actually a little more obscure, I think, or, you know, it requires a little more thinking <clears throat> to figure out how you're gonna do this because it is the actual partial pressure of water vapor at the inlet where it's not saturated divided by the partial pressure of water vapor at saturation at the inlet temperature. So this in the denominator, this is just a lookup and we've looked up that number enough at 80 so you, the, the, the bottom pressure, you just look up at saturation from the steam tables. So it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And we go back to our tables and we get a number like 0.5073, which we've looked up before. 
But then you got to get the numerator. Well, where are you going to get that? Well, so we're going to go back to the 0.6219 equation because now we know uh, the humidity ratio coming into this guy. And so then we can use that to calculate the partial pressure of the water vapor. Okay, so, so that W1, which we're going to set equal to the 0 0.009, is equal to 0 0.6219 times that partial pressure of water vapor divided by the total pressure, in this case, 14.696 minus that partial pressure of water vapor. So you got to multiply, you got to do a little bit of algebra, but no big deal. And so we come up with 0 0.2098. And so then that gets divided by the saturation uh, pressure at 80 degrees and shows us our relative humidity is 41.4% uh, or 0.414. Okay, now I'll tell you, this is one of my favorite problems. <laughs> Something like this will be on your psych test. I tell people that every time. And of course we got a ways to go before we get through psych and it's often forgotten, but I will give you something like this and ask you to go through these calculations, something like that. So uh, just please note that. Okay, very good. All right, so now let's see. Yeah, so now we get to this next example. We wanna go back to the lecture notes here real quick. Uh, yeah, part two. Okay, yeah, so we started this last time. We're gonna go through three or four of these, they call them classic moist air processes. And the first one, the easiest one is simply heating or cooling moist air where we don't change the moisture. So we're not injecting moisture with a humidifier and we're not gonna get it cold enough to condense any moisture out of it. So we're not gonna to get to the dew point. Okay. Uh, and uh, we did this last time, but so we're just gonna go back and forth. So if you're cooling, you're gonna start at one and you're gonna cool it down. And it's basically along this horizontal line because that's the amount of moisture in the air. And so if I go up, I'm adding moisture. If I go down, I'm taking moisture away. So uh, all I can do is slide back and forth at this same humidity ratio if I'm not gonna change the amount of moisture in the air. So that's not too bad. So, you know, something in the problem tells us, okay, we're gonna start, maybe that's 80 and we're gonna to go to, you know, 72 or what, whatever the numbers are. So that would be cooling. Or we can start at 72 and go to 80 or 90 or whatever, however high we want to heat it up. But we're not gonna change the moisture. Okay. And then, so we, I think we, we wrote the equations last time. This is just an energy balance. And this probably should be a capital Q. Um, <laughs> sometimes when you write notes, you, you take liberties, but this is the total heat transfer because this is the mass flow times the uh, enthalpy. And of course we only have one mass flow. So right now I've got the mass flow coming in times the enthalpy in. And I only have, I got a summation, but I only have one, one flow, one stream in, one stream out. And so, <clears throat> this m dot e is gonna be equal to m dot i. And, and so down here, it gets called m dot a. So we just kind of change the name of it. So uh, this is the energy in to my device. Let me see, do I have a picture? I don't know that I, I don't think I have a picture of this device, but I mean, we're just, we're just flowing in and we got a coil, we're going across a coil and yeah, it's, it's either being heated up or cooled down a little bit. Um, so the energy in plus the Q, and so if it's being heated, that would be a plus Q. If it's being cooled, that would be a minus Q, whatever, and is equal to the energy going out. And the energy in is the mass flow rate of dry air. Remember all the mass flow rates are per unit of dry air, and then times the enthalpy in, but the enthalpy is binary because I've got my dry air so I've got enthalpy in the dry air, and then I've got enthalpy in the water vapor. And the W, W1 tells us how much water vapor, you know, uh, what pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air in. 
And of course, that's going to be equal to out because, you know, so these two things are going to wind up being the same number in this. And then this is just the enthalpy uh, out. I, I'm sorry, there, there, this is the enthalpy of the water vapor. Okay. So this is the amount of water vapor per pound of dry air, and this is the enthalpy of the water vapor. And so all that uh, adds together to give us the total enthalpy coming in at one. And then at two, we do the same thing. We just do it at the exit condition. And in this case, because we're not moving up and down, we know W1 and W2 are happen to be the same number. But in general, once we start changing moisture levels, that doesn't obviously have to be the case. It's just in this particular process. Okay, so you just do a little bit of algebra. And so you see that the total heat transfer is the mass flow rate of the dry air times the enthalpy difference out minus n. And so, you know, if, if, it's, if it's colder, if this is a cooling process, the enthalpy out is gonna be less than the enthalpy in and this will give a minus. If it's a heating problem, then the enthalpy at two will be greater than the enthalpy at one and it'll give a, a plus number. Um, we can also do this with uh, M dot CP delta T. It works fine. You just have to be careful to realize that this CP is actually a binary CP because that water vapor in there is get, being heated and cooled as well. So it's not just the dry air. So you can't just plug in 0.24, you have to go through this calculation where this is your humidity ratio and uh, CP uh, V I think is 0.444 in US units or if it's in metric, I don't know, you'll have to look it up. <laughs> okay, all right, so that's that. Now let's go back and we've got a little example problem here that we'll work through. Uh, let's see. Okay. So let's see. Three, four. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So find the heat transfer rate required to warm 1500 CFM, and CFM is cubic feet per minute. So you need to know that. If you've got any kind of an HVAC course, you got to know what CFM stands for. Well, that's not a mass flow, right? That's a volume flow. So that's the first thing you know in these problems, you're almost always gonna get a volume flow. And when you do, you know, first law analysis, you gotta have a mass flow. So you're gonna to have to convert all these volume flows to mass flows. Okay, and you know, when you see this CFM, you wanna note at what condition that CFM is given to you because you're gonna to have to look up a density or a specific volume. We look up specific volume typically because that's on the side chart, but it's one over density. You can work with either one you want to. If you're doing calculations, it might be just as easy to use density. But, and so that 1500 CFM is linked to this 60 and 90% because the specific volume is gonna be different at 60 degrees than it is at 120 degrees. And so if you calculate the mass flow rate of this 1500 CFM at the 120, you're gonna get a different number than you're gonna get at the 60. And so that's kind of one of these little quirks or one of these little tricks of working problems is when you're given the volume flow, pay very close attention to at what condition that volume flow is given you because it's mass flow that's constant through the process, it's not volume flow. You know, if you heat it up, it's gonna expand and you're gonna get more volume. And if you cool it down, it's gonna contract. So there's no guarantees on having 1500 CFM at every point, you know, we've got a hot point and a cold point. It's not gonna be the same at both points. So you gotta pay attention to that. Okay, uh, and so we're, we're just gonna heat it up without any moisture addition to 120. So on the side chart, uh, this, let's say we, if we started at two over here, then this point one would be over, all the way over here. Or I guess I've got a side chart I can show you. You know, so this is, uh, you know, we're down here, dry bulb. So 60 and what is, I think it's 80, 
no, it's 90, it's 90%. Okay, so there's our 90% relative humidity line swooping down and there's our 60. So at that point, wherever those things cross, uh, about right there, then we're gonna start there. We're gonna heat it up straight across until we hit 120, uh, 120, which is the max temperature on the standard site chart. Okay, so that's what it's gonna look like. Okay. Okay, so first thing we got to do is get rid of this volume flow. Okay, well, this is from your fluid mechanics. You should remember this. Um, up here in the numerator of this, this uh, capital V1 bar is average velocity. Okay, and average velocity times cross sectional area. So that would be, say, feet per minute times feet squared. So that's gonna be cubic feet per minute. So this V bar one, A1, that combination is the 1500 CFM, okay? And you need to remember that because it's possible you could be given a duct diameter and asked to calculate a velocity of the airflow in it. And so then you would have to use this equation and split it back out you know then if you had an a then you'd have to then you could use this to solve for the the v bar and it's a v bar because it's an average velocity across that profile you know you got zero slip at the wall and whatever it's probably turbulent so it's going to be a fairly blunt profile coming across and then you have to divide that by the specific volume or multiply it by density so and this is what this is feet cubed per pound mass and so the feet cubed up here or the feet cubed up here in the q dot cancel the feet cubed down here and then that results in pound mass per minute is what's going to come out of this if you've got cubic feet per minute coming in okay so just review that make sure you're comfortable with it in all of the terms okay so i so said specific volume um, is read from the site chart at 13.31 at 60 and 90. Well, let's go look and see if we agree. 13.31. So here's 60 coming up and there's 90. Okay. And there's 13 and a half. And I guess that's going down. So 13.4. 13.3, pretty good. You're pretty much right on. It looks like it's a little bit above 13.3. So 13.31 is a pretty good read. So I'd say he's got that right. The other thing he's gonna do is he's gonna have to read uh, an uh, enthalpy for this. And so you gotta read up in here, you know, there's your 25 BTUs. It's a little bit beneath it. Uh, this next line, boy, it's hard to see in there. That's about 26. And so we're someplace in between 25.4. You know, you get a straight edge out, you know, and you can, you can get pretty close off a psych chart, especially if you get your ruler out and uh, do it that way. Okay, so let's see. Well, and that's why we're here. So we're, we're here and we're going to go straight across over to 120 and that 120 line, that's right on 40. So for the enthalpies, we're getting 25 and some change and right about 40 BTUs per pound. So let's see how that lines up with what he's got. Well, let's see. So, okay, so here's his enthalpies, 25.3 and 40. So that's pretty clear. Okay, so here's, here's the calculation of the mass flow rate. He wants pounds per hour because he's, he wants to get to BTUs per hour. So he's going to multiply by 60 to convert the minutes to hours. So 1500 times 60 would be cubic feet per hour. And then dividing by the specific volume will convert from cubic feet to pounds mass of dry air per hour. So we're 6762 pounds mass dry air per hour. And here's our two enthalpies. 
saw, wow, this isn't bad at all. So we just plug in uh, what M dot delta H. And so we're heating up. So this you know, could be considered a positive heat transfer being added to the airstream. So the mass flow rate times the 40 minus 25.3 gives 99,400 BTUs an hour is required. If you were specking this thing and that's what you needed, you'd probably want to put in 110,000, 120,000. You know, heating capacity is pretty cheap. Uh, so it's okay to go up because, you know, it, maybe it's going to get colder out than this. <laughs> maybe the polar vortex is coming. Maybe that storm that came through from the Arctic that swept down through Texas is coming through and you're going to have a little extra capacity so you can keep your house warm when it's colder than the typical design temperature. So that's not a bad deal. But, okay, I don't know if you guys out there could hear, but the question was, is there a typical percent by which you might want to oversize? And man, is that a great question. It, it's just up to the guy making the decision, you know? Um, I would say, well, heating capacity is far cheaper than cooling capacity. You know, like if I was to add an extra 50% on heating capacity, you know, on a fairly, you know, typical small commercial project, I'm probably not gonna add all that many thousands of dollars to the cost. And I'm gonna have all that wonderful heating capacity. If I was to add an extra 50% on cooling capacity, I would be jacking the price of this thing way up. So you gotta sharpen your pencil more on cooling than you do on heating because it's much more costly. Okay. Um, you know, on, on something like heating, I would probably want at least 20% extra. So if this thing came out right pretty close to 100,000 BTUs an hour, I'm probably looking at 120,000, maybe even 140 capacity wise. You know, you, you can check that with your suppliers and say, okay, how much? If I, if I went 140, how much? And then you gotta look at airflow too. If you jack it too high, you may need more airflow than you're really gonna be pushing. And so you, you could hit an airflow limit. But uh, I would say 20% is not bad, you know. But again, it's, it's kind of up to the monkey making the decision. You know, if he's been bit a couple times, some of these contractors out there, they don't mind adding some size to something because they'd rather pay a little more on the front end. Well, come to think about it, they're not paying a little more. They'd rather have the customer pay a little more on the front end. Where they get hurt is if it's, doesn't have enough capacity and they have to change something out. And then everybody starts, then there's restocking fees and everybody starts whining, okay, who's gonna pay this $10,000 restocking fee? And, and you know, he's gotta go back twice and he's got a lot of additional labor. And so, you, you know, not many things really get undersized in the real world, you know, if everybody's, unless, unless a, a big mistake gets made or something. Good question. Okay, and so this is using the M dot CP delta T and notice we've got 0.245. So that 0 0.005 that got added to the 0.24 is the humidity ratio times 0.444. That accounts for the water vapor that's also getting heated up from 60 to 120. So you gotta be a little careful. If you're gonna use that CP, don't forget, you can't just slam 0.24 in there. Okay, all right, that's pretty good. So let's go back, oh, get out of there. <laughs> I hit that thing and I make it come down and then I can't get to what I need to get to. Okay, so let's move on to our next moist air process, which is uh, cooling and dehumidifying of moist air. So here, moist air, if you cool it below the dew point, some water vapor will condense and leave the airstream, okay? So let's look. On a site chart, we're gonna start at one 
and we're going to wind up down here at two. But if you, and, and it's a, you, a lot of times this process line is kind of just dotted in because, you know, it, it's hard to know with certainty exactly what that process line. People that build coils uh, take data on this and you can maybe find some data for a particular coil, but it depends on how many rows and the depth and the temperature of the chill water and all that sort of thing, exactly what the process line looks like. But so uh, as far as dew point determination, if we take this point one and come at constant W, we just come across until we hit the 100% um, relative humidity. At whatever point you hit that, you can come down and read, and that's your dew point. That's the point at which some, when, when water vapor at that pressure hits that cold coil phase, it's gonna condense. Now, if you think about it, you know, if, if you think about a coil, it's got, it, it's got tubes running back and forth with chill water or cold refrigerant in it. And then it's got fins on it. And the fins, you know, conduct heat into the refrigerant. So you really have a whole bunch of different temperatures in there that this water vapor can uh, come in con to be cooled to. So some of the water vapor slips through. I mean, you know, I mean, fin spacing looks real small to you and me, but if you were the size of an air molecule, it would look like from here over to Brunner Hall. And there's a whole bunch of your brothers, make, you might hit the surface and condense, but there's a whole bunch of your brothers that are running down the middle that are just getting cooled down a little bit and they're not condensing, you know? So you, you don't get, you certainly don't get it, all of it to condense out. That's why there's still plenty of moisture in it at the exit, but we do manage to condense some of it. And the amount that you need to condense out, that's part of the coil design. And from the HVAC perspective, you go to the to whoever's manufacturing the unit and they give you specifications on what their coils are capable of, you know, given your inlet condition. So at any rate, so we're gonna start at one and we're gonna ride this kind of bendy line down here to two which is where we're finished. Now, it's, it, it's interesting, you can kind of break this up because we're, we're gonna talk about sensible cooling, which is reduction in temperature. Latent cooling is condensing of water from vapor to liquid. But if you look at this, if I come straight down at, from this temperature, at dry bulb temperature, I can draw a line here. And then at this one, I can draw a line at constant W and where they cross, let me make that just a little bit bigger. We're calling point, point A. <clears throat> well, so we can think about this process as two processes. We can think about one to A and see one to A, we're going straight down on the site chart. So that's moisture removal. So that's the latent cooling capacity for this process is from one to A. And then from A to two, we're doing all of this at constant moisture level. So that's like a sensible cooling. So this is like two processes put together. <clears throat> now, in terms of, if you want the overall energy impact, then you can do the mass flow rate. Well, we'll see the energy balance in a second, but it, it's basically, you know, enthalpy at one minus enthalpy at two, and that takes care of both processes. But if I wanna know the uh, latent load in BTUs per hour, I can go uh, enthalpy at one minus enthalpy at A times mass flow. And if I wanna know the sensible, I can go enthalpy at A minus enthalpy at two. And then if I add those together, and I've done my math right, it should equal the mass flow right times enthalpy at one minus enthalpy at two, you know, so, but you can break it down into those two processes, as we'll see. Um, that's what it looks like on the side chart. This is kind of a, a picture of the device. You know, we've just got, basically, we've got a coil in the ductwork. And so the uh, control volume is just the air. It's not the coil or it's not any of the hardware, it's just the air around the coil. Because 
because we're going to uh, indicate the heat transfer by a Q dot term. And see, this is where I get the little Q dot. <laughs> That's what the authors use. They probably should have a big Q dot in there, really. But anyway, that's why I wound up writing my notes to kind of parrot this back if, if for people that have the textbook. But anyway, so the control volume is just the air, and then everything else is uh, heat transfer uh, to from the air. Okay. All right. So let's look at the uh, energy balance. So. Um, Coming in, you know, I've got my mass flow rate of dry air times the enthalpy coming in. So that's up here. That's what's coming in. Up here, I've got mass flow rate, enthalpy, and moisture content coming in. I've got mass flow rate, and I'm going to have the same mass flow rate because I just have one flow through this thing. So I've got the same mass flow rate exiting. It does have a different enthalpy because if this is cooling, it's going to be lower. And uh, it, it probably is going to have less moisture because I'm going to wring some moisture out. Okay. And then the moisture that falls out is going to fall in my little condensate drip pan and it's going to fall out of the airstream. And I'm going to call that M dot W, which is the moisture that condenses on the coil that falls out of the control volume. And it comes out at uh, some enthalpy. I think that's BMW, but I can't, <laughs> it's so small, I can't read it. But anyway, that's the enthalpy of the water, that's of the condensate that's fallen out of this thing. Okay, so, you know, we've got mass flow rate times enthalpy N. And then the Q, you know, we're showing it a plus over here because really it's minus on this side because that, that air comes in hot, energetic, and then so we're going to subtract some Q from it. And, and I don't know, I just wrote it on this side of the equation to write it as a positive. Uh, and then we've got the uh, mass flow rate of the air uh, times the enthalpy leaving. And then um, the mass flow rate of the water that's fallen out of the bottom from the condensate times the enthalpy of the water falling out of the bottom, okay? So that's the energy balance on this device right here. And then we can write the water balance. So that's pretty straightforward for sure. So the amount of water that comes in, it's the mass flow rate of dry air times the humidity ratio because humidity ratio is pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air. So when you multiply those together, you get pounds of water vapor uh, per minute or hour, whatever time base you have on your mass flow rate. Okay, And uh, so this is what comes in. This is what leaves in the air. It's the same mass flow rate times the humidity ratio at two. And the difference has to be what falls out the bottom. Okay, So water in equals water out in the air minus water out in the condensate. So then we can easily solve for M dot water. And so M dot water is the mass flow rate of the dry air times the quantity uh, humidity ratio in one minus two out. Uh, and then we're gonna substitute that in up here and rearrange. And when you do, then you can uh, calculate the, uh, uh, the total heat transfer. So the total Q dot is, <clears throat> so this is gonna be the mass flow rate of dry air times enthalpy in minus enthalpy out. And so this is gonna give us a positive number Say, you know, these equations sometimes play fast and loose with sign conventions, but I1 is, is hot, humid. I2 is cool, dry. And so I1 is greater than I2. And that's by far the biggest contribution here. This has to be positive. So this whole term is going to be positive and this term is going to dominate. So for our cooling, this equation is going to give a plus, even though our thermodynamic 
sign convention would be a minus. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> stuff happens, you know. Um, so let's see. Uh, and then th this is the energy in the condensate, right? Is the mass flow rate of dry air times this uh, humidity ratio difference is the flow rate of water, and that's the enthalpy of the water that leaves. Okay. So this is the total heat transfer from the moist air, and it will give a positive quantity. Note this last term is usually small and is often neglected. Now, if you have computer software or something that you're using this with, then they're not going to neglect it. But if you do these by hand, you know, sometimes, and I think we got an example here we'll go through. I think it's like, I don't know, a percent or something difference. I mean, it's a pretty small amount compared to the energy exchange in that first term. Uh, the, the amount of energy in the condensate is really pretty darn small. I, it, does, it probably doesn't cause in 99.9% .9 of the cases, it doesn't cause any problems to ignore. Okay, so now we want to look at example three, five. Okay, so let's go back to this. Uh, we can make that a little bit bigger probably. Okay, so moist air at uh, 80 dry bulb and 67 wet bulb is cooled to 58 dry bulb and 80%. Okay, uh, the volume flow rate is 2000 cubic feet per minute and the condensate leaves at 60 degrees. Find the heat transfer rate, okay. So let's, uh, let's see, we got it, we're gonna, uh, I don't have a site chart. Uh, we kind of saw a psych chart on it before, but let's see if we go back to here. There we go. So it's exactly this. And we can do it in one fail swoop or we can break it into pieces if we want to. Okay, so let's just look. Um, and you can check these properties. I think, I think they're pretty good. Make sure, I mean, it, it's a good exercise for you to get some experience on the psych chart. So take this, um, pull out a psych chart and uh, just make sure that you would come up with roughly the same numbers. I mean, if you, if you were doing, if people do this on a test, no, everybody doesn't come up with exactly the same numbers, but they ought to be in the same ballpark. You know, you can pretty well tell when somebody's wandering in the wilderness uh, by looking at what numbers they pull off a site chart. Okay, so uh, the specific volume at one, uh, 1385 feet cubed per pound mass dry air and an enthalpy of 31.6, uh, humidity ratio of uh, 0 0.0112. Uh, pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air. And then I2, after we've cooled it off, we're down to 22.9 BTUs per pound mass of dry air. And the humidity ratio is down to 0.0082. Uh, the enthalpy of the condensate, you, we, we've got tables for that. That little thermo table would work perfectly that I gave you. Uh, 28.08 BTUs per pound mass of the water that leaves. Uh, okay, so these problems typically fall into a very similar rhythm. You know, you get used to working them. You know, the first thing you usually do is get your, get your mass flow rate from your volume flow rate. So again, 2000 cubic feet per minute times 60 to get cubic feet per hour, divide by specific volume, we get 8664 pounds mass of dry air per hour. And then we're gonna plug in that uh, equation that we had and we'll, we can go verify it, but uh, let's see. So he's factored out the mass flow rate of dry air because that was in both terms. So he's got that out front. 
And then this is just the enthalpy difference of the air in, moisture air in minus moisture air out. And then this is the condensate. So this is the humidity ratio in minus humidity ratio out times the enthalpy of the water vapor. And then all that arithmetic gets multiplied by the mass flow rate, okay? And so you can see here, he, he, he breaks up these two bracket terms. So this first one, this 31.6 minus 22.9 is 8.7. And this arithmetic on the humidity ratio and the enthalpy gives 0.084. <laughs> So let's see, let's see, let me get my calculator out here. So 8.7 plus 0.084 equals 8.784 store one, 0.084 divide by times 100. And it is a little less than 1%. So the energy in that condensate, at least in this little problem is about 0.96% of the total. And so that's why it's not uncommon to just leave that out of the calculation because it just doesn't make much difference. Okay. Uh, let's see. So he says, neglecting the condensate term, Q is roughly 75,000 BTUs per hour. And remember, a ton of refrigeration is 12,000 BTUs per hour. And so if you just divide the 75 by 12, that says that's a 6.25 ton unit or tons. You can't buy 6.25. Well, if you were specking uh, air handlers, you know, you could probably spec a coil and they could select a coil that's pretty close to six and a quarter tons. Of course, you know, you haven't rounded up or anything. So, you know, they do make a standard seven and a half ton unit, which is probably where this would, would go. Something like that. Seven and a half or 10. Uh, 10 is starting to get pretty hefty oversizing. If you really think, if, if you think that's your max load, six and a quarter, uh, 10 is pretty heavy duty. You know, so you're probably not going to go 10, but you could easily go six, uh, seven and a half and have a little extra. Okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. What's he doing here? Uh, so let's see. So we're going to do um, the sensible. We could calculate the sensible heat transfer a couple of different ways. Right, we could do m dot cp times t1 minus or yeah t1 minus t2. If we go back to the I don't get I can't believe I don't have the okay, I have to go back to the other file, but well, we can do that. So that's this one. Okay, so if you m dot cp delta t then basically you're saying, I mean, that's just the sensible heat transfer and you would calculate your CP at this W2. Let's see, this is our approximation of the sensible. This is our approximation or a calculation of the latent, okay? So then that CP would be 0.24 plus this W2 times 0.444 whatever that, I don't know that he does that. Does he put numbers to it? Uh, but that's the calculation there. So, you know, you've got M dot A, that's no problem. You calculate CP and you know the temperature. So it's a, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. Okay, so then for that latent heat transfer, he's gonna go the mass flow to dry air times the humidity ratio one minus two. Well, that's what's going to get condensed out. And then we've got the enthalpy of vaporization because that's for the phase change from the saturated vapor to saturated liquid, okay? 
So that's, an appro that's one way to calculate this. Uh, the, the latent heat transfer going from one down to A. Now we've got other options. <clears throat> um, we can also just pull enthalpies from the psi chart, which is why I would be tempted. I would probably do that, you know. So I would just come up here <clears throat> and we read I1, we read I2, and then you have to come in and read uh, IA, which is in between, but I mean, it's, it's the same thing. It's just for a different point. <clears throat> and so then the latent is the mass flow rate times I1 minus IA, and the sensible is the mass flow rate times uh, IA minus I2. And if you add them together, you get the total heat transfer, okay? Uh, okay, and then the other thing that's mentioned here is the sensible heat factor. And so that is Q dot S divided by Q dot total. Okay, and we'll go, let's go look at a psych chart and take a look at that because we have that protractor scale. And the protractor scale. Is right here. Okay. And let's make it even a little bit bigger. Ooh, that's good. I like that. Okay. And so um, what you can do is for, uh, in fact, and what we will do shortly is let's say we ran the loads on the classroom here. And so the carrier program will give us a sensible load, a latent load, and a total load, okay? And usually the latent load is, you know, maybe 15, 20, 25. You know, if it's like a, a theater with a lot of people breathing out a lot of moisture, it may be 30, 35%. Typically, let's say it's 20%. <clears throat> so then of your total cooling load, 70 or 80% would be sensible, 20% would be latent. So then your sensible heat ratio is going to be 80 divided by 100, or it's going to be 0.8. Okay. Then you can come over here. And you see over here, you can draw a line from this down to this. You can draw a straight line and you can take that slope over here to the site chart. And of course I got a huge site chart now. <laughs> and let's say we were, our inlet air condition was someplace over here. I can draw a line with that same slope on the site chart, and any point on that line could be a supply air condition that would satisfy those loads because it has the right combination of coldness and dryness to satisfy a load that is 20% moisture and 80% sensible. So when we get to systems here very shortly, and we don't have to understand all this today because we're going to come back to it multiple times. But th this protractor is extremely useful to us when we start working, you know, like trying to size equipment and actually lay out the entire cycle um, and do the calculations for it. So we'll come back to that uh, before too long. Let's see. So I think we're finished here. Yeah, so there's another example we'll get to, but we got to do some more over here first. Okay, let's see. That's this. Yeah, we did that. Okay. Well, I've got. I guess I've written lecture notes on some of that, so we can we can look over those. But I think that's pretty much what we have uh, talked about. Uh, cooling and de dehumidifying involves both sensible and latent. 
So sensible heat transfer, change in dry bulb temperature, uh, latent heat transfer, change in humidity ratio, change in the amount of moisture in the air. Uh, and you see the uh, equations written out. So M dot CP, again, remember this is a two term CP and then just times your uh, dry bulb temperatures and the latent mass flow rate of dry air times the difference in humidity ratio times that enthalpy of vaporization. Yeah, this is what we just went through. Um, so lurking in the background is the energy and the condensate, which we basically treat like a redheaded stepchild. <laughs> I hope nobody's redheaded and offended by that, but you know, it's just an old saying. We don't, we don't give it a whole lot of respect that condensate, you know. So uh, well, it could be added back into all this, but usually is not. Uh, here's the sensible heat ratio, sensible heat factor, Q dot sensible, Q dot total, and we'll use it later. Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, so our next process uh, is heating and humidifying moist air. So it's a similar situation, except now that coil that we've got in there is going to heat and so you've got hot water, maybe you got 150, 160 degree water going through the coil. It could be hot refrigerant. It could be a heat pump. It could be 170 degree refrigerant coming out of the compressor, whatever. We got something hot. And again, the control volume is just the air. So the interaction between that coil and our control volume is just a heat transfer rate, Q dot. Um, and so we're going to start at one, we're going to go across the heating coil, we're going to put some heat into it, and then we're going to hit point A, and then we're going to spray some uh, moisture. That moisture could be liquid droplets, or it could be steam, it could be all kinds of stuff, but usually it's either we take it to either be steam or just atomized water droplets that have to evaporate. So there is a big difference. The steam is already in the vapor state. You know, you got a steam humidifier, it's plugged into the wall and you got electric power or something going to it. Or, you know, somehow you're, you're making steam and just injecting steam. On the other hand, you're injecting atomized liquid that has to evaporate. So that if you're injecting steam, you're probably gonna heat up the flow more. If you're injecting atomized water, you're probably gonna cool it down across that humidifier because those droplets have to evaporate and that evaporation process cools the air straight. That's where the energy comes from to evaporate. Okay, so during cold weather, the outside air is very dry and can require the addition of moisture uh, with heating processes. So, I mean, it's nice, you know, I know I don't have a humidifier at home and in the winter time, I'm always slogging lotion on my hands and my arms and my legs and my back and all this stuff because it, the skin dries out because it's so dry and uh, you itch. And you know, if you don't do something, you can crack and you can even get bad enough, you can crack and bleed, you know? So, you know, it's nice to have a humidifier. I don't know why I've never put one in. I guess I'm too cheap to buy one, I don't know. But I just never have. Um, okay. So <clears throat> we write our energy balance and we're gonna write these to be positive quantities. So this is the energy in, again, mass flow rate of dry air times the enthalpy. And the enthalpy is a binary enthalpy at one. And then we're gonna add some heat to it. We're gonna put some BTUs in. And then uh, we're gonna go across the humidifier and we got some mass flow rate of water and that water enters with some enthalpy of water. It could be a liquid enthalpy or it could be a steam enthalpy, depending on the state that we actually inject that water into the airstream. And then everything leaves, okay? So, so uh, then 
So we can put in uh, sensible, we can put in latent and that combination with what came in, all of it gets to X. I say, yeah, now we're assuming we have a well insulated duct and we don't have any heat transfer and you know, there's those simplifying assumptions here. Okay, and so the uh, mass balance on the water vapor is, you know, M dot A times W1 is the water vapor flowing in. Uh, pounds mass per minute or pounds mass per hour. And then this is the amount that we're adding with the humidifier. And then all of that has to leave. So that's M dot A times W2 and all of it leaves. Okay. okay, so if we do some combining and some slick little algebra here, we can come up with these equations. <clears throat> So 338, so you put that in, you do a little factor in and do a little dividing and all that stuff. And so we can get that the enthalpy difference I2 minus I1 divided by the humidity ratio difference, W2 minus W1, that ratio is equal to the amount of sensible heat transfer. You know, somebody, BTUs per hour probably, divided by the mass flow rate of water added. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the mass flow rate of uh, dry air. I couldn't read my own subscript there. So that's M dot A in the denominator times uh, W2 minus W1, which is that whole quantity is the mass flow rate of water added, plus the enthalpy of the uh, water, whatever state it's in. Like I said, it could be it could be uh, liquid droplets, and I have an enthalpy of 28, 30, 32, 35, or it could be steam. It could be 11, you know, a thousand, 11, 50, whatever. Uh, just depends what you know how, how you've uh, designed the system. Okay, so if you look at this, these last two equations give. Um, the slope of a straight line connecting the initial and final states. So that's kind of interesting. So what we see here is, here's where I'm starting, here's where I'm finishing. And by golly, that's just a slope. And you know what? If I go back to that site chart, not wrong. Look at the outside scale of this thing. Oh, enthalpy delta. Now this, the side chart uses H for enthalpy. The book uses I, so, you know, we've got to change in symbols, but this is delta H over delta W. And so you can pull a slope over of here. And you know what? That'll be the same slope that we get if we connect points one to two. Well, that's pretty handy. That's a pretty handy tool to have. Okay, that's one thing to think about. Okay. The other thing to think about is let's divide this up <clears throat> into um, processes. So let's just come across here and let's think about heating going across the heating coil. So the heating coil is all occurs at the same W1. So I just draw a line across here someplace. <clears throat> and then the humidification connects this wherever we stop heating and start humidifying, we, that's point A. And then we, the humidifier takes us up to point two, okay? So well, let's come back to that. Now let's look at this equation for a second. So this is the slope of the process. What if I just want to look at the humidifier? I can still use this same equation. I just have to modify it because I don't have a, if I'm just looking at the humidifier, I'm going from A to two. Well, there isn't a coil in there, right? No coil. Well, so how would I modify 
either one of these equations, if there's no coil, there's no Q dot, right? <laughs> there's no coil. So you can set this Q dot equal to zero. And all of a sudden you see the slope of that process line is the enthalpy that you spray in there. Hmm, that's interesting. And that's called adiabatic humidification. Okay, so, you know, this is, so one to A is just heating at constant moisture content. That was our first process. A to two is adiabatic humidification because we're not considering the coil in there, okay? So when I draw the lines, I draw a line across here and I know where I'm gonna wind up. And then I go up here and I find this delta I over delta W that is the, as the slope of the enthalpy of what I'm spraying in. So let's go to the side chart. Uh, I get more, I get more junk calls. Um, okay, so for a, stan a standard number for steam is someplace around 1,000, 1,100. Uh, 1150, I think, is a number that gets used in some of the problems. So here's this scale. So see, there's 500, there's 1,000, there's 11. Let's say 1150. So see, at 1150, we get a slope as we go up we, you know, we are gonna have an increase in temperature, okay? But so you can, you can draw a line through there and through say, if it's 1150, you put a little tick mark there, you draw a line, you take that slope and you come over here to the side chart. And that is the slope of this line, okay? And so then you start up here and you draw with that slope down and wherever that line crosses this line defines the end of the coil and the start of the humidifier. <clears throat> so this is, I mean, once you kind of get it, it's not very hard, but you got to think about this a little bit, okay? Now, that steam, what would happen in this case if I was spraying liquid water and atomizing it just into little droplets so it would evaporate. Well, if I go back to my side chart, well, here's zero, there's 500, so what is it? There's 100, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. So, you know, you're gonna have a slope then coming way out here like this. Hmm. <laughs> that's going to change what my chart looks like quite a bit here. Oops. What did I do? Did I close one down? And I, I guess I, I don't know. Hmm. Did I close that? Yeah. I closed it, didn't I? I'll be darn. Ah, these things. Okay, it's this guy. Ah. No. Oh, I, get, I forget my own. These file names are not good. It must be this one. There we go. I swear. There we go. Okay. So if you had liquid water, that slope would come off like this. And, it, and so when you draw this process line from the end 
you wind up going way down here. Most of the time you go off the psych chart, which is not very convenient. <laughs> you start saying bad words. Who, who gave me this problem? <laughs> I don't like that guy. He ran me off of the psych chart. So we do have some equations here that we can use. Uh, you can get a high temperature psych chart, which in this packet that I did send you guys, I'm pretty sure I did. You go down some of these things. This, so this is low temperature. This is a really nice pack. This is uh, high temperature. And of course, I have to rotate. And I want to go, oh man, it's never easy. Rotate counterclockwise. There you go. And so this guy, let's see, you could probably do. Yeah, this guy, this guy goes from what, 60 to 250. So say if you were, now let's say, do we get a, do we get a protractor on this guy? I don't know if this guy's got a protractor on him. Yeah, we got a protractor. So, so you're good to go. So you could work it on this one with, because uh, it's not gonna go that far. But what you would find is that what that temperature was one, 120 and I'm not sure how many was someplace over here. You would see that line going way down over here. And so what's happening is that heating coil has to heat it much hotter because when you spray the liquid water, it's gonna cool it down and you're gonna to have to ride up that line to get to your 120, which is your desired leaving condition. Okay, okay. I think that's, uh, we're not quite to the end, but we're pretty close to the end. So I think I'll cut it off there. Uh, let's see, we got one more class. This is Tuesday, I think. <laughs> and then you guys have break. So we'll, uh, we're moving through. We've got probably three, maybe four more, probably three more, eh, four more lectures in psychometrics. One more assignment, and then we'll be looking at the psychometrics test. And beyond that, then we'll be looking at, you know, various topics to just kind of mop up the uh, semester. So hope everybody has a great rest of the day and uh, we'll be back in touch. I'll get this link out to you as soon as uh, uh, I get it uh, processed and over on YouTube. So take care for now. Bye.